It is time for another edition of the MMA Report Podcast. Of course, I am Jason Foy. And as always, joined by Daniel Gavon. Talk about everything going on in the world of mixed martial arts. Daniel, happy Thursday. How you doing, bro? Man, I am doing absolutely fantastic, Jason. It is a happy Thursday. We are in the um, the middle of, you know, not the most interesting week of mixed martial arts action coming off of a fight night that wasn't super exciting. Coming into a fight night that isn't super exciting. The next one isn't great. But you know what? At least we get to see Jake Paul fighting Mike Perry. You know, <laughs> that's going to kind of get my appetite sated. But um, otherwise, I'm doing great. How about you, Jason? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Doing pretty good, man. Yeah, you, you talk about Jake Paul, Mike Perry actually happened here in my hometown of, of Tampa, Florida on Saturday night. Uh, I mentioned this on the podcast last week, and, and I put it on, on my ex profile as well. Amway Arena was doing BOGO tickets, which not a good sign. I know people who are uh, involved locally in helping promoting th- this fight card, and uh, I've seen some things they post online. And I'm just like, all right, they were doing BOGO tickets a week ago. That's that's never a good sign when you're a week out from the event and you're doing BOGO tickets. No, no, which is surprising to me. But, I mean, uh, things have changed when it comes to Jake Paul. And he just doesn't feel like appointment viewing. He He's interesting. But the way we felt about him when it came to his first few fights, he certainly has lost his luster. I don't know why do you think that is. Is it because... We've seen him fight Tommy Fury close. Excuse me, didn't mean to burp on you. Is it because we saw Tommy Fury fight close? Is it because he hasn't fought that many interesting dudes? Why are people not into Jake Paul? I think they're just over the. I, I may, and maybe this is more speaking from my thought process. Like I was, I was watching his interview on Pat McAfee's show, and you know he continues to talk about wanting to be a boxing world champion, wanting to be known as the best cruiserweight in the world. I'm just like. If that's and I understand that boxing is it's it's a slow approach, but at some point you got to stop taking on MMA fighters. You have to take on boxers, and you have to take on boxers that we truly feel have a. It's just not a showcase fight, and no, you're right. and, and I've I I'm telling you what, like he continues to this Mike Tyson fight, like, bro, if you want to be a world champion, why are you taking on a 59 year old fighter? <laughs> yeah yeah it's um i mean mike tyson is is that fight just should not happen again when you look at how that last fight was canceled it just rings off all these alarm bells health problem i mean it's 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 one of those deals where you're kind of rooting for mike perry for the sake of mike tyson mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know yeah. mike perry get the dub but, yeah, if Mike Tyson's going to fight anyone, it should be, like, someone in his own age group, right? Like, we want to do the Roy Jones fight. Do the do fight Rampage Jackson. Yeah. Fight Shannon Briggs. Like, fight someone your age. But when we're starting to deal with this massive age gap mm-hmm. with a young in-his-prime athlete, even if he's a lot smaller than Mike, it's not something I want to see because I've been there, done that. I've seen – Hoist Gracie and, and uh, you know, come back. I've seen Dada 5000 and Kimbo Slice. Yeah, I don't want to see these old men in these high-level athletic competitions anymore because legitimately it puts their lives in serious danger. And, and look, being here in Tampa, I don't, I don't sense there's a lot of buzz for this. Um, I will tell you, I mean, look, I, I work for a, a restaurant group and – one of the questions I had this week because I'm over on, on Johan's website and, and Johan has this this great tool for us to basically say, you know, hey, here's the events that we have. Who are the bars that are confirmed? And I was like, fellas, there's no one within 40 miles of us showing this. Should we show it? And, and it also maybe said, maybe the, the, the interest in Jake Paul just isn't there. I mean, this is, you know, his past couple of fights have actually been a part of uh, the DAZN boxing series from a, a commercial aspect, which I will tell you is super cheap. 
by the way, Carissa Shields is on that next week. So I think that kind of tells you where maybe the appetite for Carissa Shields is at, at this point. But yeah, I think I think for the most part, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be rooting for Mike Perry to go out there and get the win. But like, it, it's just one of those things as I was watching the Jake Paul interview, and I'm just like, man, like, if you truly want to be serious about this boxing career, like these are not I mean, these are not the fights you should be taking. Like I totally understand the, this mindset of building yourself up, and I think we're seeing that happen more and more in mixed martial arts. I, I saw some people complaining this week on, on MMA Twitter about a fighter who's stepping up next week to be a part of UFC 304. Daniel, in all reality, a very padded record very padded record but this is i think what we're starting to see happen more and more in mma and and i've said this to people like i understand on the regional scene you want to test yourself you want to you get there but i also say is why take a ufc level fight at regional level pay yeah yeah it's and when there are so many opportunities to get in the UFC at that level, we're about to get into the contender series where Mm -hmm. it's not hard to get into that spot. It just makes no sense. And it's a big reason why a lot of the product outside the UFC just isn't as good as it once was. I mean, it's just, you, it's just high quality fighters and showcase matchups by and large. And you will get some really good main events on your LFAs. And, and a couple other promotions and a couple interesting fights, but by and large, it the regional scene is just being used to prop up the high level prospects and pad their records, kind of like boxing. Yeah, I mean, as I go over to Ticketmaster here, because I remember when I, I got that BOGO offer, I was like, oh, you know, let me let me see what these tickets are, are going for. I mean, look, if you want to get in the building, you can get in the building as low as thirty dollars. Now you're sitting up in the three hundred section in arena, which would be, you know, the top of it. But like, if you wanted, you know, like a section two fifteen ticket, that's sixty five dollars. Um, if you want to go down low, you can go a seven, you know, a seventy five dollar ticket. But in I'm not trying to be a negative Nancy about this fight on Saturday, but if you tell me, do I want to spend money to go see Jake Paul versus Mike Perry or six days later, spend money to see the CFFC show that's going to be here. I would rather pay money to go see the CFFC show than go watch Mike Perry and Jake Paul. And you can call me a hater, whatever. I would rather go see the regional mixed martial arts action here in Tampa as opposed to going to this boxing event. Well, it certainly has more value to you as a mixed martial arts fan to mm-hmm. see these yeah. up and coming fighters. And it's one of the more premier organizations out there. So uh, I can't blame you. I mean, they're just, uh, there's not much more in this boxing card that's got me excited. There's a couple of names that are like, oh, I remember, I know him or whatever, but. It's really just about seeing if Jake Paul can get his ass beat. I mean, that's just what people are paying money for. Mm -hmm. It's a long wait. Long wait to spend that much money to get in that arena and wait to see that happen. Yeah, I mean, the the CFFC show that's here uh, next week, uh, Robert Watley is defending the lightweight title against Marcus Forrest. Um, Also, there's a couple of other fighters. um, uh, Max Quinones is a a flyweight, 5-1 flyweight uh, out of the Tampa Bay area. He is someone that definitely I have my eyes on, and I think that's a guy that, you know, potentially maybe we see in the UFC in, in the next maybe, you know, Eight twelve months if he, if he can continue on, on this winning path and, and look we clearly know CFFC is one of those shows that if you're looking to get to the UFC it is a great pathway for you to get to the UFC there and of course uh, you know over there on, on on Fight Pass that you can check out uh, their their shows and you know, John Morgan does a great job there calling those fights for CFFC but like I, as I sit here on a Thursday morning I've not had one friend text me and go hey do you want to go to the fights on Saturday or hey do we want to find a bar to go out and watch this fight? But I, I think, I think like most mixed martial arts fans, I mean, God, yeah, I, I'm hoping Mike Perry goes out there and get the win because the one thing you can say about Mike Perry, this guy is winning at the business of fighting. Like you, you think about how many fighters just don't get the financial success out of the UFC. Mike Perry is a guy that has done absolutely amazing capitalizing on his fighting style and who he is and putting a ton of money in his bank account. And you know, that's a surprising fact 
whenever he started this venture, I didn't think Mike Perry was going to be the guy we would hold as the gold standard on how to make a living out of the bare knuckle boxing world. I remember when he initially made the signing and I thought it was just going to be a nice little deal, but I really didn't think he was going to become what he has become, which is the example, the example of how to fatten that bank account. And I don't know what it is exactly about him, other than the fact that he's just a damn good striker. He is a, he is a really good striker. And, you know, now to me, there's some appetite one day to see him back inside the octagon. I don't know if that's going to happen because he's going to take a pay cut. But I'm looking at this guy and how well he's doing. I'm just like, man, this talent level is something I wish I could see competing at the highest level in the UFC. But you do worry about the takedowns under a hypothetical scenario like that. But yeah, Jason, without a doubt, Mike Perry has become the example. The great idea a fighter can think about whenever they make that big time risk. And the thing is, like, there aren't that many more. So why do you think things have gone so well for Mike in this realm? I think it's his fighting style. I mean, at, at the end of the day, like, after the Jake Paul interview on, on McAfee's show, they get into talking about bare knuckle, which if I'm bare knuckle, I'm like, I'm I'm calling Pat McAfee's show up and going, hey, can we get David Feldman on? Can we get a fighter on? I mean, but I thought they brought up a really – interesting kind of thought process is if you're turning on bare knuckle and they they even relay this if you if you turn on power slap if you you are just that combat sports fan that wants to see someone go get knocked the f out bkfc power slap is the thing to go watch if that is what you want to see nine times out of ten that's likely what you're going to get out of every fight yeah yeah absolutely and um, it appeals to people. It's, um, it's interesting. And now for them, it's just a matter of getting that distribution out there, getting your product in front of people's eyeballs and getting on the Matt, Pat McAfee show is certainly a great way to do that. But in terms of this fight, I, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I get the sense this will go the distance. Between Paul and Perry, I'm picking Jake Paul to win this fight as much as I want Mike Perry to win. I mean, to me, Jake has really the type of guy that gets his ducks in a row and doesn't take fights he's going to lose. So I'm just going to assume he's going to win this one. But would it be great if Mike Perry took the knockout you see in bare knuckle and brought it to us on Saturday? Hell yeah, that's what I want to see. As you said, that's 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 what we love to see. People get separated from their consciousness, mm-hmm. right? Like we'd love seeing that knockout at the fight night um, last Saturday. Can't even remember who did it. Montel Jackson, like a straight, yeah, like on Blackshear. Yeah, we love seeing that. Love seeing that. It's just uh, it's something primal, you know. It turns us back into the caveman. We're like, oh, oh, phenomenal, <laughs> oh, oh, you know, yeah. So I lo- love that stuff. Absolutely do. Yeah. No, I mean, look, we, we all sit there and we, we love the knockout. But, you know, as we kind of move forward, one, you know, one of the, you know, the, the binge worthy shows that's out there on Netflix right now. I know I, I, I've been watching it. Uh, a friend texted me last night. They're watching it and it's receivers. Of course, last year it was quarterback. This year, it's receivers put on by Omaha Productions, which, of course, is the Manning's Brothers production company. I've watched the first, I think I've watched the first three episodes. Now, I mean, absolutely tremendous. I mean, absolutely tremendous. And Daniel brought this up of saying, if there was a MMA version of receivers, who would we want to see on it? There were two names who immediately came to mind, just because I think, you know, God knows what they might say. Sean Strickland, Derek Lewis. Yeah, those are two great ones. I would actually, on my list, I'm going with names that you wouldn't think of because to me, there is an all-star team you can already come up with, right? Like Sean Strickland and Derek Lewis are first ballot all-star team members of this show. 
Because already they're so entertaining, so outrageous, so out there. You know if camera crews are following Sean and Derek, you never know what you're going to get. I mean, to me, the other fighter I would put on that list straight up is like Bryce Mitchell. Is someone who, I mean, yeah, there's going to be a lot of editing. At least it won't be live. Are, 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 you, are you signing up to be an editor on the show? <laughs> no, that would take a lot of editing. But the thing with Bryce Mitchell is he does some crazy stuff all the time. Like outside of some of the really problematic stuff he says in his real life, like he's like a farmer. And, you know, I, when I watch the UFC countdown show or the UFC embedded, I'm always like, what the hell is this guy doing on a Tuesday <laughs> with these cattle? You know, and then obviously to fill out the all star team. I think Conor McGregor is a no-brainer, clearly. And, and, you know, John Jones, it might be good for him to have a camera crew around him um, to to keep him, you know, not in trouble with the law. But in terms of my actual list, if I was going to have five MMA personalities, you know what my number one pick would be? Who's that? Wouldn't be a fighter. When we do this show... He would never say yes because he's got too much money. I would love a camera crew to follow Joe Rogan, too. Make Joe Rogan one of the characters of the show and follow his life. I, I just I want to see what Joe does that we don't see. And granted, we see most of his life because he does seven-hour podcast five times a week. But he's such an interesting personality. To see him go from his comedy stand-up show uh, that he owns a little place in Austin, the mothership to, you know, waking up at 4 a.m. to jump in a cryotherapy bath. And then I think he probably spends six, uh, you know, six hours studying science because he's a real expert in science. So I want to see how he gets that education. But Joe Rogan would be one of the five people I would want to see followed in a UFC style documentary show. By the way, you speaking of John Jones, I saw a hilarious meme on the MMA Reddit uh, earlier this week. It was, you realize John Jones has more arrests than Habib and Ron Madoff has title defenses. That's crazy. <laughs> Unbelievable. But honestly, pretty believable. Yeah, yeah, very believable. I, I will say this. I did not have Connor or John Jones on my list. Didn't have Bryce Mitchell on my list. There were some names I thought of that, you know, because I'm thinking about as I've been watching this and you're, you're learning about George Kittle, what his life is like. And um, I want to say it was episode one, episode two. It was his birthday. His wife brings in all his friends. They go to the game, whatnot, as a birthday party at the house after the game. Uh, Or you you see the family dynamic between Justin Jefferson and his family. And so it made me think of, like, who are the fighters that are notable fighters in the UFC that I feel like we really don't know a lot about them? Drake is Duplessis. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. And, and I think that's what the show can absolutely be used for and should be used for. And that's why I would advocate not going for someone like Sean or Derek Lewis or Connor is because we know them. We know who they are. We know all about them. So I love the DDP pick because we don't know him. And he's probably an interesting personality, so I, I, I like it. And that's kind of the theme of my list. And to, to, to piggyback on you, man, this is a, the one problem on my list is I have a lot of people who don't speak English, so it's like a lot of I, subtitles. I, so when I started kind of doing the research and writing down some names for this, that was kind of one of my thoughts of would people – I mean, I'm not a closed captioning person. I'm just not. But, like, there, there are some fighters I looked at, and I said, like, Diego Lopez, clearly a rising star in the UFC, you know. Um, but then there was other ones I looked at that were English speakers I thought would be kind of interesting. Raquel Pennington slash Tisha Torres. Kayla Harrison. Yeah. Juliana Pena. How many people are really watching Alexa Grasso on The Ultimate Fighter? Yeah. And and those are good fighters, man. And and I think when it comes to the women's side of things, I think the no brainer is the Kayla Harrison pick. But maybe someone like Jasmine Jazzer Davizius or 
Aliana Perez or Mackenzie Dern, Tracy Cortez, and maybe that's the type of fighter you would go for, or, or Aaron Blanchfield, you know, maybe looking at some of the up and comers. But if I was going to lock in one fighter, it would be Kayla Harrison. I, I think she has to be a part of this show if I was casting it. And in terms of the international fighters, like I would consider, I would seriously think about putting in someone like Tetsuru Tyra or Shafkai Rachmanov in this show because I do believe either of these two fighters are going to be a top 10 fighter in their weight class for the next five to seven years. So that's why I would invest in them. But I, I end up not pulling the trigger because there's one fighter that will bite the bullet and do subtitles on. I think you got to go with the one of the best fighters on the planet. I want to see Alex Pereira. So he would be the third person I would ask to be a part of my show. In terms of international fighters, Ilya Zaporia was on my list. Obviously, rising guy. There's one guy, like, if you said no to Sean Strickland, but you needed kind of that guy that you know is going to say something and is going to get people talking, you know, on social media. Yeah. I know you're talking. Yeah. Colby Covington. Yeah. Oh wow! I thought you were gonna go Ian Gary, but both of them. Ian Gary, Ian Gary. I literally, I, I have twenty one fighters that I listed as candidates. Here, here's the twenty one fighters: Strickland, O'Malley, Holloway, Duplessis, Taporia, Harrison, Gary, Aspinall, Moreno, Lopez, Poirier, King Green, Pena, Tuavasa, Covington, Holland, Whitaker, Lewis, Grosso, Pennington. Hill. Jamal Hill. Yeah. That's a good list. That's if you told list. me, if, now if you said I got to pick five, I think my number one would be Duplessis. Two, I would go Harrison. Three, Diego Lopez. Four, Alexa Grosso. And I think five, I would go with Cal Pennington. Wow. It's an interesting show. I mean, Lopez Grosso can kind of be like George Kittle, Debo Samuel. And there's an advantage to doing that because in the receiver show, you know, they're following five different personalities. But because Debo and George are on the same show, you really – they kill two birds with one stone when they focus on one team. So it actually makes this show – it's smoother. It's a smoother show when you're really doing two birds and one stone. So I like your show. If I was going to fully flesh out my cast right now, I have Joe Rogan, Alex Pereira, Kayla Harrison. The other female fighter I really strongly consider was Tatiana Suarez, but I'm not going to pick her because uh, my number four is going to be the ultimate rising star in the UFC. You know, there's two that I really looked at. Like I looked at Raul Rosas Jr., but, might need subtitle, so I'm gonna go with Bo Nickel, and then um, I mean he's just the best. Bo Nickel is, and uh, I would love to see that. And number five, I think there's three names I'm looking at here: Izzy, Max, and Marab Davishvili. And I'm gonna go with Marab. I think he's gonna be the next champion. And even though he has, he's the guy between those three we know the least about, and most importantly, as entertaining as Izzy's coach is. Marab's coaches are just the most entertaining group of gentlemen you could you could ask for. So to have them as side characters, you know, long go Sarah. I mean, come on, I mean, it's you can't you can't ask for a better supporting cast than those two guys. So I got to get him in the show, and I think Marab's going to be the next champion. So you got to follow him going for the title. So in 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 in, in conclusion, you have a. Uh, DDP, Grasso Lopez, Raquel Pennington. Uh, who's, the, who's the fifth fifth one? Kayla. Kayla. You very uh, – and I got Marab Pereira, Joe Rogan, Bo Nickel, and Kayla. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that if you were the UFC, you would probably be more looking at who do you feel like is the, potentially the next pay-per-view stars for you. I mean, look, and – we're going to talk uh, when we get in the MMA news uh, section of, of this episode. We're going to talk about Kayla Harrison a little bit because uh, Julian Payne making some accusations this week. But like, I would look at her and say, and, and look, it, it would not shock me at all if Kayla Harrison 
is the next title challenger for Raquel Pennington. It would not surprise me at all if, if that ultimately does take place there. But like, yeah, like I just feel like like I look at DDP and I I just feel like we don't really know a lot about him. You know, like you 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 think about like 2009, 2010, 2011. I just felt like we knew more about the fighters. Now, maybe that's that's a, an example of just because there are so many fighters in the UFC now that it truly is tough for the UFC to really tell the story of the fighters because I thought on the UFC Denver broadcast uh, during the preliminary card, I thought the UFC did a really great job of just telling the story of Tracy Cortez and, and, and talking about what she has been through in her life to get to that point. I thought they did an incredible job to, of telling that story. Yeah, yeah, and it was uh, it was something where there was a lot of opportunity to tell that story because there wasn't much on that fight card to distract you from, mm-hmm. but it got you invested in the main event, and it was uh, yeah, it wasn't the best fight card, wasn't the best main event, but it was one of those things where after that fight night when we're doing this topic, you know, Tracy's one of those names I would consider. She's just a very interesting personality. Yeah. You know, she got some flack for for cutting her hair and holding it on the scale with that picture, even though obviously she weighed in without holding the hair. But, uh, yeah, Tom Aspinall was roasting her a little bit. What did Tom say? I mean, it was basically poking fun at the fact that the, the picture was her on the scale with her hair cut off, but she was holding the the hair she had yeah. cut off. So, you know, the science doesn't back up the, uh, even I, uh, though obviously she had weighed it without it. I want to say it was during the broadcast uh, when they went to the desk and they're showing the clip of Tiki Golston cutting Tracy Cortez's hair and Karen Bryant's basically like, yeah, he cut it at the wrong spot. He's supposed to cut it there. I was, I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of funny. But like, as you think about UFC Denver and, and you think about the no performances, we already mentioned about Montel Jackson going out there in 18 seconds, beautiful one, two combination. Didn't even need to throw a punch on the ground. I mean, uh, Damon Blackshear was out there. Charles Johnson coming back uh, in the third round to get that knockout there against Joshua Van. Uh, Juicy J going out there at first round submission. Uh, Gene Silva, definitely a guy. I think when you talk about fighters that on these fight night cards that you're 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 looking at, say, hey, why do I tune in? I think Gene Silva is becoming one of those guys. We had the no contest with Al Hassan and Brundage when uh, Dan Mergliata paused the fight. I knew it was over. Brundage had that look. Yeah. Good. I, I, I like Cody. Body language, I was like, he's not continuing. He and and I just, I wonder, I wonder, did he think that they were going to rule a DQ? If he knew it was going to be ruled a no contest, would he have continued? That's what I wonder. I think after 30 seconds, he knew what was going to happen, and he didn't want any more of that. I mean, now his song was kicking his ass, and it hadn't even been a whole minute. So I just think he was like, right, I'm opting out. I am opting out of the rest of this experience, because if this fight continues, I will be separated from my consciousness. So I just think he made an executive call. But it is a while that after 40 seconds to realize that, hey, uh, I don't want none of this. and hey, It's all on how it's on. He's the one who did the illegal strike. If he had not done that, we would not have been in this position, but he still looked really talented. I mean, look, bro, straight up, number one draft pick on most impressive fighter had to be Gene Silva. Like, you start to look at his resume and what he's done in the UFC and prior to the UFC, and you look at his stand-up, and it's just like, this dude's dynamite. So to me, Gene Silva is like the number one fighter you need to pay attention to after this fight night. He, to me is going to be a force at lightweight. Obviously, Rose, you know, got the job done. It wasn't the most fun fight in the world. Rounds one and two were better. To me, also, the big storyline was altitude. A lot of fighters gassing in this fight card. A lot of fighters gassing. Um, And then, you know, Luana Santos very easily beat Maria Agapova. Just a phenomenal grappler. And uh, she's incredibly talented. And, you know, to me, my second favorite fight of the night behind Silva and Dober was was Charles Johnson and Joshua Van. Um, it was a fight that Van was winning. And as soon as the round three started, Charles Johnson turned the tables in the flyweight, got the big W. 
Yeah, I mean, that was just an impressive uh, 20 seconds there. Uh, in, in the third round, Luana Santos, she looked good. Kind of, uh, I really saw that one coming there. Uh, Muslim Salikov getting the win. You know, Rose Dami, it's going to be kind of interesting to see what happens. Um, I, I think it's really, we're going to see a little bit of a domino effect here. Alexa Grosso wants to be at UFC 306 in the spear. A lot of rumblings out there. Shevchenko doesn't want that date. But the UFC wants Grosso on that card. So maybe that's going to be Manon Fierro potentially steps in there. Rose Dami Yunus versus Aaron Blanchard, I think, is a fight that makes a ton of sense if they do not want to go down that Macy Barber path again. I think that's a fight for Rose that makes a lot of sense. But really, I think it's going to just be a domino effect of what kind of happens with the title matchup at UFC 306 and where everything falls in its division. But to me, Blanchard versus Rose seems like to be the, the logical matchup. You know, talk about a fight we've never seen before. Rose versus Shevchenko yeah. is one of those marquee matchups that is a possibility now that Rose is fighting at 125, you know. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of, like, a, the female version of Dominic Cruz and Jose Aldo where it's like, oh, they were in spitting distance of one another and they never really fought. So to me... If you can build to a Rose Shevchenko fight at some point, Jason, that's a fight I really want to see. That's a fight between two of the top seven most important female fighters in the history of this sport. So I, I do like where your head's at. The Blanchfield fight does make sense. But before it's all said and done, let's give Shevchenko and Nami Hunis in that cage against one another. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm with you on that one. That would be an interesting one uh, to see how that one does play out. But, of course, uh, we are back to UFC Apex fighting this weekend. UFC Vegas Ooh. 94, headline by Amanda are you Lemos. Sure? Are you sure we're in the Apex? We have that stacked main event, Amanda <laughs> Lemos and Verna Jandaroba. Are you sure we're in the Apex? You know we're in the Apex. And we're Apex fighting, bro. But, like, this is a fight card that, to me, just screams of, if you lose, your days in the UFC might be over because we're about we're about getting rid of a bunch of fighters to so get all these contender series fighters in there. Obviously, <clears throat> noble matchup in the main event of Lemos and Jana Roba. Huge implications in terms of that division. You know, you've got some veterans on this fight card like like a Brad Tavares, been around the UFC since 2010, taking on Jung Young Park. You got Steve Garcia, Sung Woo Choi. That to me has the recipe of. Someone's probably walking out with a performance of the night bonus. I think either one of those guys likely going to get knocked out uh, in that one. Duo Joy, Bill Algeo, I think stylistically is probably the fight that intrigues me the most in, in terms of this fight card just because of, you know, I mean, look, we, we, we know who Duho Choi is. We, we know how, how, how exciting of a, of a fighter. That he is there. Uh, Miranda Maverick, unfortunately, you know, she was supposed to take on Tracy Cortez on this fight card. Now she takes on Diana Barboza. Um, you know, but to me, like, obviously, main event in- intriguing. Duho Choi about Geo intriguing. The rest of the fight card, we just doing some fights, Daniel. This fight card sucks ass. Dude, this fight card is so bad. Um, yes, Jandaroba Lemos, it's a fine fight between two talented strawweight fighters. I mean, Jandarobo's won three in a row. Lamos looked good against Mackenzie Dern. In all likelihood, they're probably going to stand and trade and have a good scrap. That's going to be a good main event. Algeo Choi, damn. When that's your number two fight on a fight card, you're so screwed. Because as a consumer, we're getting a bunch of crap on on, on, uh, on Saturday. There's no other way to say it. You know, the UFC gives us some amazing cards, some amazing pay-per-views, but... This is a this is a just a nothing nothing apex card. Yeah, I mean Tavares and Park is the co-main event. Choi and Algeo will actually open up uh, the main card here. Uh, you got Cody Durden taking on Bruno Silva. I will tell you this: I did not think Cody Durden would make it this long in the UFC. I really did not. He's one of those guys that has really uh, surprised me in that one. You look at the matchup, Brian Kelleher. And Cody Gibson, that just screams whoever loses. Likely their, their time in, in the UFC is going to be over. But, I mean, look, it's you You look at that main event at 115 pounds. It's it's a notable matchup. You know, Lamos right now, number three. Jana Roba, number five. You know, we'll see what we're going to do with, with Zang Lee. Of course, you got Tatiana Suarez right now as the number one contender. That obviously would make a, a ton of sense as the next title challenger. But if Jana Roba or Lamos gets the job done on Saturday – 
they're right there, in, in, at least in the discussion, to being next for Zhang Wali. Yeah, absolutely they are. And and uh, it's a fight you know is going to be badass because the fight style is there. It, it's going to bring the best out of each other, whoever wins. Possibly fighting Zhang, sign me up for that. But, yeah, this weekend sucks ass, man. It's all about Perry Paul. And I tell you what, maybe this is the week to dip your toes into another MMA promotion. You know, we have KSW up in Poland, and we have Octagon MMA, Octagon 59, Summer Party in Bratislava, Slovakia. Do I know any of the fighters on this fight card? No, I don't. But I might go for the vibes. I might go for the vibes and, and check out some Octagon, check out some KSW. Again, oftentimes, I'm not going to come out here and always criticize the UFC. Sometimes they give us some damn good shows. To do this weekend, Uncle Dana is giving us a really, really bad fight night. I mean, this is just just a fight night that does nothing for me, right? Like, it's it, it's not great, you know? It, it's one of those Saturdays where you have to go out on a date. If you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend and you're an MMA fan, you need to use that Saturday to go and, 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 and be a person um, – that's a human being for your partner. Hold on. So you're telling me I can't I can't make the suggestion of date night being, hey, let's go watch Mike Perry and Jake Paul? That is how you become single. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I you, so you you're telling me that's a horror. I should I, I should pass on that idea. That's I need to come horror, you, I need to come up, I need to come up with better ideas that what you're telling me. Brother, we got college football season coming up. Use your Saturdays wisely. You know, we're going to be asking for a lot of favors in a couple of months as we get into the thick of football season. Oh, oh, oh you mean because yeah. training camp is here? Tra- I mean, yeah. Yeah. Your, te- your Texas I reported mean, yesterday. Bucks, Bucks report uh, rookies on Monday, vets on Tuesday. It's, uh, I mean, hard knock. It's not the preseason hard knocks, but the fact that we're already seeing hard knocks. On the television screen, yeah. uh, freak man, I'm so excited. We have the new game system out, the new game, and and we've we've texted about this. They they knew what they were doing <laughs> whenever they made it only available on the new systems because they knew there was going to be a lot of lapsed gamers that really wanted to play NCAA football but hadn't bought the new system. And now all of us are looking to spend freaking 600 bucks just so we can play as Kennesaw State and bring them to the Natty. <laughs> but uh, I, can't, I can't wait to get that PS5 and get that game and start playing as Texas A&M because that's the only place I can see them actually win a damn national title. Yeah, I, I'm in the same boat. Uh, I have an Xbox One, so it's not available on Xbox One. So if I'm going to play the game, I, I got to go out and fork over the 500 bucks for a brand new game system. Same here. What are you going to go, PS5 or Xbox, whatever it is? Uh, if I did the Xbox, I would do the X because that's uh, got 4K capabilities. Right now, my TV's mm-hmm. not 4K, but like I might as well just get the one where, if I could. I think if, if you told me one or the other, I'd probably get the PS5. I haven't had it. My last time I had PlayStation was probably PS2, maybe? That's such a long time. You probably owe it I've been, to I've been, so I've been an that. Xbox guy since. Yeah, I've been Xbox 360, then I went back to the PS, PlayStation after the 360. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm a PlayStation guy. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, if at some point I know I'm just going to bite the bullet, I'm just going to do it. I just haven't bit the bullet yet. But yeah, like, dude, all these, I, I, all these TikToks and reels I've seen of people playing college football and basically talking about how, how hard the kicking is in the game and basically saying how they should have spent more NIL money on a kicker as opposed to a quarterback. That's going to be so frustrating. But, you know, I guess that's going to give me an excuse to always go for two, which I always did in the first place, and always go for it on four down. So I'm just going to be oh, playing like that, that oh, high school Oh, you're that asshole. Yeah, which if, I, if I'm not making my kicks because it's confusing, I'm sure as hell not going to keep on kicking it, boy. <laughs> I'm going for it. 
Yeah, man. I, I, I've not gone down that rabbit hole, but I have a feeling that I will probably uh, go down that rabbit hole at some point. By the way, uh, you know, talking about MMA fighters and boxing, Nate Diaz looking to get paid. Fi- Things have not worked out for yeah. Nate Diaz. So there's a, a lawsuit gets filed. And then I see, you know, and basically Nate Diaz is at, when the lawsuit was filed was basically um, the promoter owes him $9 million, hasn't paid it. And uh, Nate Diaz last night did tweet, I ain't suing nobody just so we're clear. Well, there's a lawsuit, Nate. It was filed. Yeah. Yeah. It's not something you can just kind of like he said, she said situation. It's, it's there's paperwork. Look, Nate's probably going to not um, do this independent thing much longer. I think I actually had a dream. Um, I have a lot of MA related dreams. I had a dream that he was on part of the UFC broadcast like show. Like they had Nate Diaz on the table as like a pre-show analyst. And I was like, Oh wow, that's a really good hire. And then I woke up. So maybe that's the good Lord letting me know he may return back to the UFC. I mean, his brother has. What I thought was interesting, though, was a tweet I saw from Kevin Ioli, who the California State Athletic Commission put out the what you know the gate and what the tickets were for this event between Diaz and Maswell. It was a gate of one point two six million. Kind okay, nice, nice little gate there. Tickets sold 13,767. Okay, that's, that's a nice ticket sold. But this is where it got interesting. They only sold one $5,000 ticket. They sold zero $3,500 tickets. They sold 14 $2,500 tickets. And 6,057 of the tickets that were sold were only $25 tickets. Bro, who was the one dude or woman? Who bought a five thousand dollar ticket? I don't know. What did that ticket offer? Were you able to smoke a doobie with the fighters before the fight? Bro, like if you ask me, what am I dropping five thousand dollars on? Man, I, can you imagine being the one who dropped five thousand and this comes out and you realize that no one was even within like three thousand dollars <laughs> of the ticket price range you paid for? You were the only one, like literally the next price range had zero people paying for it. I, bro, I'm. I want to interview that person. I want to interview the person who spent five <laughs> grand on that show. But yeah, yeah, the fact that it was mostly twenty dollar, twenty five dollar tickets is not a good sign when you look at how much money people are spending on tickets nowadays. Yeah, and I, I mean, I did see a tweet where Dave Meltzer basically noted that uh, the thing bombed on pay per view. Are, are we really shocked? I mean, really, are we really shocked to say you do well on pay-per-view? I mean, I just, I, I think it's so difficult as a combat sports fan to where we, we have to sit there and say, where do we draw the line? I mean, everyone's trying to get every nickel and dime they can out of our credit card. And well, let me just ask you this. Let me ask you this. Have we already hit the, you know, superhero movies, they were real popular for a while. Uh-huh. But then they then they started making like Koala Man 47, you know, and people stopped watching because it was the oversaturation. One, are we at that point? And I know the answer is yes. With these like non, with these like silly fights, I'm going to call them silly fights. Mm-hmm. Two, what are the, which silly fights actually is going to get people to watch anymore? Is there is there one? Is it just Jake Paul I, and Mike Tyson? Is that the only one that's getting people to watch one of these silly fights? I think it has to be on a platform you're already subscribed to. I think you're right. Like if you if you would have told me Nate Diaz versus Jorge Masvidal is on Netflix, it's on ESPN Plus as part of the regular subscription. Would I have watched? I probably would have. But was I going to fork over $50 to watch that pay-per-view? No. 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 
Yeah, and we just get so many of these. And, and there's some really cool concepts, you know, like karate combat is a really cool concept. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't want to hate on that one. But, you know, you're seeing Darren Till on a random influencer card that no one cares about. It's just a bunch of stuff no one really, no one cares about at all. Um, and, and we're there at that point. So, yeah, I mean, the bloom is off the rose, Jason. It, it just is, and I think you're spot on. It comes down to if it's already on something I'm paying for, yes, I'll watch it. Look, but. I just I just got this email in a couple of minutes ago where Peacock is raising their monthly subscription price. So their premium monthly, which was five ninety nine, is going to be going to seven ninety nine. This so this is a effective August seventeenth. Premium plus goes from eleven ninety nine to thirteen ninety nine. Premium annual goes from fifty nine ninety nine to seventy nine ninety nine. Premium plus annual goes from one nineteen ninety nine to one thirty nine ninety nine, uh, and premium plus add on only monthly remains at six dollars. That's crazy. That tells me they need the, they need some money, and they may not have my money for that much longer because the WWE is going to Netflix. So it's like. What the hell am I watching Peacock for? Are, why, are, why are the, are, but aren't the premium live events staying on um, Peacock? Oh, if they are, then I guess I have to stay on Peacock. I, for some be. reason, I, I thought I, I thought I remember that it's just Monday Night Raw is going to. Um, oh, that makes Netflix. sense. If, if 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 that's the case, then never mind. I will stay on the cock. But uh, that's the only thing that's got me on the cock is the WWE. <laughs> If I was an asshole, I'd just clip that. <laughs> hey, man, I love the cuck. <laughs> it's got it's got all the classic, you know, dudes in underwear that I want to see. Yeah, I, w- I was watching a little bit of uh, Monday Night Raw on a Monday night. What did you see that you liked or didn't like? Uh, it, it's interesting kind of, um, I think it's, I think the WWE is doing a really great job of long-term storytelling. You know, I think they're just doing a lot better job. You know, I think you, you look at kind of this long-term storytelling they've been doing with the Judgment Day and how much they're kind of recreating the China Eddie Guerrero now with, with Dominic Mysterio and Rhea Ripley. You look at the White Six stuff. I thought they did a really good job uh, in, in terms of that one. I just think that overall, I mean, their product's on fire right now. I mean, it, it's absolutely on fire. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's really cool to see Dominic Mysterio kind of look like Eddie Guerrero with his mustache and his mullet, and yeah, uh, it's a lot of good storytelling and a lot of good shows that the WWE are doing. Side note, I don't think we can come up with any answers, but maybe it's an interesting topic to do some research on. So WWE has a a YouTube channel called the WWE Vault. It's not the best. It's not as cool as it is because it's mostly them just showing old matches we've all seen before. But there's a couple of uploads of like footage that you never thought would see the light of day that they do. So maybe an interesting topic for next week or one of these weeks is what is that great MMA lost footage that is some, just waiting to be unearthed that's out there that people would be interested in? Because so much of what we've seen is, is available in the history of this sport. But I do wonder, maybe this is for the viewers, what is out there that we haven't seen that isn't readily available? That we would love to see. I mean, is the first ever UFC fight available somewhere? I don't know that question. I would Maybe imagine. I, I would imagine. You know, I would think it's at least you know a UFC talking, fight pass. You know what I'm talking about, right? You talk about UFC one? Yeah. What's the first ever fight in UFC history? I I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. It's not. It's not your. It's not Gordo and Thule. The first ever fight. Was uh, it was like an like a non tournament match? Let me Google this, and let me see if it's available. Um, the first ever fight was Jason Delucia and Trent Jenkins. Let me see if I can find this fight. First, Trent Jenkins, 
Oh, I can find it, I think. So I guess it's out there. It I, looks like you can watch UFC one on ESPN plus. But I didn't I didn't know if Delucia and Jenkins was a part of the broadcast, which I, I feel like there's no way it was. I, there's no way it was. This was like a straight yeah. up preliminary bout. It had to have started with Thule and, and Gordo with Gordo knocking out Thule's uh Thule's front tooth. But I, I wonder what you know, I just watched this fight. Never seen this Delucia Trent Jenkins fight, which you know, it's just when people think of first ever UFC fight, they think of Thule and Gordo. But it was, in fact, Jason and Jenkins. And uh, I, I wonder where that fight was distributed, if it was part of like an extras feature on the VHS or DVD, because I would be stunned if that fight was actually on the pay-per-view, just because, to me, the presentation of the show would have been just the whole tournament. It would have been Thule Gordo. But um, I'm sure there's a Reddit thread out there. Uh, of what is that great unseen footage. I mean, it, I'm sure there's some stuff with Hicks and Gracie that we would mm-hmm. love to unearth and, and, and check out. But, yeah, it's, a, it's important to take a look back at the history of the sport. You know, the sport moves so fast, Jason, that we forget about all the great stuff that has already happened. And, you know, it's important to take a, a look back. Oh, no, we, we definitely forget things that happened uh, and just move past it. Let's let's wrap up this episode by talking about some of my news and notes. Juliana Payne was on the MA Hour on Monday, and uh, she made PED accusations about Kayla Harrison. Kayla Harrison responds on X saying, I have been tested by USADA since I was 12 years old. You will find every excuse in the world not to fight me, and the only shot in the ass people need around you is anti-nausea medication. All right, Kayla. That's a good comeback. Yeah, it's... uh well played and to be frank i am just out on juliana pena until she fights again i just do not care she talks too much crap for someone who never fights think about this hey, I hate to say last time we saw juliana pena in the ufc octagon july 30th 2022 talk about entitled entitled she's just straight Look. up entitled I have no problem if she is the next title challenger for Raquel Pennington. I have zero problem with that. But it's kind of hard to make case when, when you're talking about since 2020, you have fought four times. Now she's had some injuries, pregnancy. But at the end of the day, if you're not active, it's, it's I think it's tough for us to be all in on you being the next title challenger. Yeah, I mean, she's got the big win over Amanda Nunez, but after that, what's your her, favorite her, win she has over, over yeah, an active UFC fighter? Her wins have not aged well outside of Amanda Nunez. I mean, if you're talking about notable wins inside the UFC – Jessica I, Kat Zingano, Sarah McMahon. I mean, pro- she doesn't pro- have a pro- win over it. I'd probably rank that Kat McMahon I. Bro, there ain't a single person she's beaten that's still in the UFC, mm-hmm. including Nunez. You talk about names from the past that we forget about. Nico Montano. Yeah, the inaugural champ. What's she up to nowadays? Just look at her topology. Last time she fought was 2019 against Juliana Pena. Then she had one, two, three, four, five, six canceled matchups. The last one being in 2021, where she missed weight. Crazy. Has not fought since. And she'll she'll always go down as the inaugural flyweight champion. Yeah, I was just pulling. Right, I was me, just pull, yeah. I was pulling up her Instagram to see has she been. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, her last post on Instagram was three weeks ago. Five what weeks ago, doing? before that, promoting um, Baby Foods Farm. Dude, how many inaugural USC champions do you think you can name? Inaugural champions? Yeah. <clears throat> I 
I'm I'm thinking was she the inaugural champion? Yeah, she was. Jer- she no, was. She was. no, no, no. I'm talking about her. Yeah, she was. Did, did Jermaine de Ronde wasn't she the inaugural featherweight champion? Oh, oh, oh. E, let me check. Yeah, she was. She beat Holly Ohm. And she never and she never took the fight against Chris Cyborg. Yeah, she was stripped of the title in 2017. Well, I mean, I think from the female aspects, it's kind of it's kind of easy. Yeah, obviously, we went it. Ronda at 135. Yeah, 115 was Carlos Barzal. We... Yes, sir. Oh, that was also a fire. She beat I went, she beat Rose in the uh, the final. Yeah, yeah. Flyweight is easy. That's DJ. Yeah. Bantam weight, you probably get it, but you might not. It would be it would him. it would be Dominic Cruz because he came yeah. over from the WEC. Aldo would yep. be forty five. Okay, now now these are the five hard ones. <laughs> now this, this is where it gets difficult. Because we're going back to before <clears throat> either of us were watching. Lightweight. I'll give you a hint. He was a coach on the ultimate fighter. My initial thought, but then I was like, I don't think he was inaugural. Was Jens Pulver? Yeah, that's the answer. It was Jens Pulver. He, he got it right, huh? He beat Cal Uno at UFC 30, and then he actually Cal Uno was the, the other name twice. that was popping in my head. <clears throat> yeah, he actually uh, he actually defended the title twice. Okay, can you get Walter Weight? I'll give you another hint. This guy's controversial sometimes. Pat Miletic. Yeah. <laughs> He defended the title four times. Wow. He held the title for 931 days. Talk about people we kind of forget. All right, middleweight. I'll tell you how this, this will give it away, but can you get it before I give you the hint? Middleweight. Okay. He was in the inaugural. He was in an inaugural Bellator tournament. Inaugural Bellator tournament. Who? Dave Manet. Oh, I never got that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was the uh, inaugural UFC middleweight champion. No title defenses. And uh, he was also a part of uh, the first uh, Bellator Walter Weight tournament. Uh, he took on Norman Perezzi and, and Omar De La Cruz. His last UFC fight was in 2006. But, uh, okay, you're doing really good. All right, we just have two more weight classes, light heavyweight. See, this where you, I know you got to go back far on that one. All I got to tell you is this is a UFC Hall of Famer that should be in and will never be in. Oh, Frank Shamrock. Yeah, I got to give that one away. He uh, he won the uh, the championship in, two, in 1997, had four titles, and he vacated the belt in 99 where Tito won it. And lastly, I'm going to give you no hints. We'll just see if you get it or not. Heavyweight. Like, there's names I know are early champions, but I know they're not the first one. Honestly, I think one of the names you're thinking of is the answer. Who? Well, but guess. Give me one guess. I, I, I... Like, all the names I know are not, are not it. I know they're not. All right. I'll give you one hint. He, you would wish he was your kid. If you were in trouble, you were wish you would wish he was your child. Who is it? Mark Coleman. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, you that dude was such a badass having his parents, and that uh, he was the inaugural UFC heavyweight champion. I don't know if it was the father of the ground and pound or the grandfather of the ground and pound, but uh, he got the big W in Dothan, Alabama, at UFC twelve over Dan Severn. And I think I think at that point it was a situation where the title wasn't defended, mm-hmm. or what? I don't know how Maurice Smith won the title, but he was the second champion. Yeah, he was the father of the ground and pound. Um, some other uh, news to mention here: uh, Dana White on the Pat McAfee show uh, did say that right now that they're only going to have ten fights at UFC Noche, which I thought was kind of a really interesting number. Uh, we don't know what the main event is. Don't know what the co-main event is. Um, there was a French broadcast that noted it was Holloway to Poria. 
as as the main event, O'Malley, Marab as co-main event, and uh, doesn't seem to be that that is the truth. So we'll see what happens uh, there. Uh, King Mo is ending his retirement. He is signed with BKFC. He's going to ma- meet David Mundell in September, and then I don't know. Do we call this the WTF moment or the delusional moment of the week? Hamzat Shemaev says he will likely return in October in Abu Dhabi. That's not the part of the story that creates a controversy here. He wants it to be for a title. Bro, the UFC cannot trust him in the title situation. Okay. They can't. They can't can't. trust him. Can the UFC put a fighter in a title fight where they know currently they cannot get him into the United States? Well, the answer to your question is yes. Yes, they can, only because they are so heavily invested in that area, you know, in Abu Dhabi, in the Middle East, that they can get away with it, but it's not ideal, Jason. The answer to your question is, yes, they can, but it's not ideal. You wouldn't want that to be the case, but because they do consistently run outside of the U.S., you can make it work, and you can just make them as the uh, international champion, but... Obviously, it's not great. You know, you can't go out there and do press, do publicity, do a world tour in New York. It's annoying that you have to limit yourself to only these fight uh, fight cards. But um, you can make it work. It's just, uh, it's not great. Yeah, it's one of these things of like, hey, man, you couldn't show up in June. So to me, if we're talking about you fighting, you wanting to fight for a title at 85, you're not ahead of Robert Whitaker. You're not ahead of Sean Strickland. Yeah. And it's not even just getting him in the U.S. is the concern. It's if he does win the title, getting him back in the cage is the concern. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's so damn hard. It's either he has the worst luck ever or, or what. But he just has had so many fight cancellations due to illnesses that you really don't feel confident putting him in that position. He's fought two times in two years. So, yeah. That is a that is a delusional request. <laughs> yeah, I, I I saw that pop across my ex profile, and I was like, and he's and he's damn good. Don't get me wrong; he yeah could be the best fighter in that weight class. It's just delusional to expect the UFC to bend over backwards for him. No, you're you're, you're spot on with that one. Uh, we stepped into uh, the wrestling ring this weekend. Yeah, on Sunday. Uh, I'm going to be wrestling locally, wrestling against a kid who... So I went to the Destin Rhodes Wrestling School, and he was a part of a class that was about two classes after me, and he's considered one of the best prospects to ever come through. So he's going to come down. I want to whip his ass, and he can go tell Dustin how good I am. That's what's going to happen (laughs) on Sunday, buddy. Clip that one. Yeah. (laughs) I'll tell you. Okay, I, I will... Here's a story from last week. So last week I wrestled a guy from New Japan, just an amazing veteran, and uh, just amazing. So after the match, I come out backstage, and he's talking to us about what we can improve on. You know, we're, we're digesting the match. It's a common practice when you hey, have yeah. a match. All of a sudden, it's really fat dude. He's like, comes up, and he's just like, Hey, guys, good match. And it was one of those, like, we all thought he was with somebody else in the match. There were four people in the match, and we thought, oh, maybe it's this guy's uncle. Uh-huh. But he, this fan just was backstage listening in on the whole conversation, giving us feedback as if he was a part of the match <laughs> the whole time. And the whole time this was going on, we all thought he was just with somebody else. I'm like, oh, this is like Chase's, like, nephew or something that's why he's back here so none of us told the guy to go screw off or go go you know so yeah imagine being like a fan at old wrestlemania 3 and you go backstage and watch hogan and andre talk about <laughs> like that it's 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 a very like private personal yeah. moment you know he's he's talking to me about how to do certain moves or whatever and we just had this random dude just you know hey guys yeah yeah good job good selling <laughs> Oh my god, that that's awesome! <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh man, yeah. I don't know what I got going on this weekend, man. I um, 
What are you, what sure. are you doing, man? You be gonna go play some darts? Probably. Well, we got beer. Beer Olympics is next, is next Saturday. All right. I, I've already. Doing? I've already told myself. I said fr- Friday night. I can't go out because last year I went out the night before, and I showed up extremely hungover. Yeah, that seems like the episode. so. So I, I've told myself like next Friday night, staying in. Get a good night's sleep. Beer Olympic starts at 11 a.m. Get there about 1030. Get the Search first out. Guy, get, you know, get, get the first beverage in me. And, uh, and yeah, I, 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 I've, I, I'm bringing in a ringer this year. I've got a ringer. You do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How big do these Beer Olympics get? Uh, there's probably about 10, 15 teams. That is awesome. How long is this going to last? The whole day? Uh, four hours. And what what are all the events? <clears throat> so last year we started off with Jenga. So what it was was you just competed as a team, and it was how many how many bricks can you take out before they fall, and then obviously how long are you at? Uh, there was flip cup. Um. Cornhole, um, the ring game, you know, where you, you're you trying to get it on the hook, and uh, beer chug. <coughs> I'm, and I'm not, and so only one person on your team has to do the chug. Uh, we have a ringer for that. Because um, I am not a beer chugger. Like, that's just not my thing. Yeah. I'll go chug a beer right now, man, before I go to work. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say, Daniel, that's probably not a good idea. Come on, man. I'm, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna make a wild assumption. Probably not a good idea to chug a beer before you go to work. I don't think it's illegal to have had one beer before you go to work. I really think you look at the letter of the law. It's okay. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Can you just have one? No. You See that? Me. That's why you can't. Like you're right. I would love to be like, hey, let's just have one beer. But I'm lying to myself. If I say that. That's just getting your beak wet. I could I, literally, if I said, "Hey, let's go have," if I say, "Let's have a couple beers," couple is not two. It's about seven. Couple's like five. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a good that you gotta <clears throat> you gotta wet that you gotta get that appetite sated. You know, you gotta you get a little thirsty. You know, one one beer ain't cutting it. Yeah, no, no. Actually, I, I want I do want to try this new burger place that's here locally. Um, I had a friend who went went to it this week, and, and they were like, yeah, Jason, it's good. It's good. So, yeah, that, that'll that probably be something I'd definitely try to check out this weekend. Get get that burger and, uh, you yeah, know, just enjoy life, man, you know? Hell yeah, brother. Get, get that burger, my man. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm sure probably wings will happen at some point. It's kind of kind of it's kind of the way it happens, the way it happens. But uh, as always, we do appreciate everyone who tunes in this episode of the podcast. Of course, new episodes come out every Thursday. Back next week, and we'll be talking about UFC three hundred four.